right we are back and do I have an answer which is better while working with uh, ultra short pulses is KDP better or is lithium niobate better KDP is better because see the problem is this what it means is that if delta nu is more than 20 centimeter inverse you will not get second harmonic generation for KDP. But if delta nu is more than 0.5 centimeter inverse you will not get second harmonic generation for uh, lithium niobate. And we know very well that the characteristic of an ultra short pulse is a large bandwidth shorter the pulse bigger the bandwidth right. So, if you are going to use a, a short pulse femtosecond pulse and use lithium niobate to generate uh, second harmonic uh, second harmonic wavelength what will happen your modal wavelength is uh, 1064 nanometer for fundamental. So, you are going to generate 532 nanometer fine, but the bandwidth will be very small yes if bandwidth is very small then we have studied transform limit limited pulses if bandwidth is small then what does that mean what does that how does that affect the pulse width pulse width become becomes large right remember the uh, delta nu multiplied by delta t that would be a constant depending on what shape the pulse is and the physical reason for that is if the spectral bandwidth is large that means a large number of uh, longitudinal modes have been locked to produce the pulse greater the number of no modes locked shorter is the pulse wider is the spectrum. So, now after uh, second harmonic generation if the spectrum has become narrow just because your delta nu is small for the crystal then automatically what will mean is that in the second harmonic light very small number of uh, modes are locked right bandwidth is small that means fewer number of modes would be locked compared to fundamental which would mean that the pulse width would be significantly larger compared to the fundamental right. Even 20 centimeter inverse is not very large, but at least it is much better than 0 0.5 centimeter inverse. So, you want a crystal so that is the first point we are uh, we want to make here you want a crystal for which delta nu is going to be large as large as possible. So, that your pulse does not become uh, temporarily broadened spectrally uh, it will become narrower, but uh, at the same time temporarily it will become broader if delta nu is small. So, in order to ensure that your ultra short pulse remain ultra short even after uh, frequency uh, doubling you want delta nu to be uh, as large as possible right and what determines delta nu the material. So, this is uh, an important point here you want to use a material for which delta nu is large okay, while working with ultra short pulses. Okay. So, uh, it is a very complicated thing first of all you want a uh, large value of second order nonlinear susceptivity right chi second order. Then you want the crystal to be birefringent. Then when you are working with ultra short laser you want the delta nu to be large as well. So, we are getting into more and more restrictions and in fact there will be one more before we complete this discussion. So far we have talked about this uh, bandwidth business next we want to discuss another uh, aspect of ultra short pulses and that is group delay we will say what group delay is, but the central theme of this entire discussion is something that we had discussed several modules earlier the issue is our ultra short laser is not a single mode laser lot of longitudinal modes are actually locked to produce the ultra short pulse 
Okay. So, whatever discussion we had earlier for during mode locking that becomes uh, the determinant in the discussion we are going to perform now. So, when we do the experiment we do not even think we tweak this we tweak that and things happen, but uh, a lot of effort by many people has gone into uh, the system before we could use it as a toy and it is important that we understand we do not need to know all the math, but we should at least under understand the principles. Otherwise, if we have to design experiment, if you do not know these, we will end up taking out a crystal from anywhere and trying to do second harmonic with ultra short pulse and it will not work. Okay. So, second factor group delay. Now, see we have discussed earlier that plane waves are characterized by their phase velocity, right. V p h equal to omega by k is equal to c divided by refractive index at that value of omega. We have talked about this earlier, yes. So, now how do I define pulse light? Pulse light you said is actually or not used, you did not say anything, I said, but you know that pulse light is a mixture of uh, many plane waves, right. So, uh, the amplitude, the wave function of pulse light can be written like this. Okay, you might, might as well write a summation in if we write an integration because it is uh, easier to uh, arrive at the next step if you do an integration. You can do it numerically as well. Okay. So, let us understand what we have written. Forget about forget about this integral for the moment, we will come to that. What is this a k a at k multiplied by e to the power i k z by minus omega t that is the expression of a plane wave we have written that right and our ultra short pulse comprises of many such plane waves. So, what we are doing is we are adding up all the fields. So, psi as you know is an amplitude and it depends on z as well as t what is z? z is the direction of propagation of light. Okay. If light goes in this direction then this is z direction of propagation of light and uh, of course, it is dependent on time as well. So, what we have is psi at some value of z and some value of t is an integral of this field for a plane wave over the entire range of plane waves. So, integral d k and lower limit is k 0 minus delta k upper limit is k 0 plus delta k. So, what is k 0? k 0 is the k value of the modal k 0 is the uh, let us just say k 0 is the modal k value. So, delta k on this side delta k on that side we are uh, working with uh, a symmetric kind of distribution. Okay. How do you do it? We are not going to do the entire integration any integration enthusiast is welcome to do so. I will just tell you how it starts and I will show you what the final answer is. So, to uh, work out this integral what is done is omega. So, as we said earlier uh, every plane wave is characterized by a k vector and an omega right a characteristic k vector characteristic omega. So, we can pretend as if omega is a uh, characteristic of k. So, we can write omega for a particular k value that is written as omega 0 again the modal omega plus d omega d k 0 multiplied by k minus k 0. Does this ring a bell? Have you encountered an expression like this somewhere in spectroscopy? Fundamental spectroscopy not in this course. Yeah, where? And a little louder please. Very, very easy question. As demonstrated many times I do not ask difficult questions. Yeah, where have you encountered? Why Raman? What about vibration? When you derive the vibration selection rule, how do you write the dipole moment? Mu equal to mu 0 plus del mu del x multiplied by x. So, that is what it is. Okay, this is a rate of change with of omega with respect to k that is multiplied by k minus k 0, it works because k minus k 0 is a small quantity. Okay. This is how it is expanded and then after doing the integration, now I will show you the final expression. Please do not get scared. We will demonstrate that it is not 
a very difficult expression. So, this is the final answer. Nothing to be scared of as you will see. Psi at z and t, particular value of z, particular value of t, turns out to be 2 a at k 0. M a at k 0 means amplitude for the modal uh, modal k value k 0. Neglect this thing for the moment. The last factor is e to the power i k 0 z minus omega 0 t that is quite simple is not it. What is e to the power i k 0 z minus omega 0 t that is the same expression you have here instead of z you have written instead of k you have written k 0 instead of omega you have written omega 0. So, that is the expression for the uh, once again the plane wave at the center of the distribution all right. I am talking about this one. I wish I had better control over my fingers, but I do not all right. This is what I am saying. So, uh, do you see that that is what comes from the uh, plane wave at the center of the distribution and this ok it is the amplitude it comes from the integration. What are we left with? What are we left with here? What kind of a function is that? Earlier we had sin square theta by theta. Is it that or is it something else? Is sin theta by theta. So, what is the difference between sin square theta by theta square and sin theta by theta? More or less similar looking functions, but there is a difference, yes. Sin square theta by theta square is always positive, but this goes negative, it not too much negative, but it does go negative. So, this is the shape. Okay. Now, this whole thing here is the amplitude of the wave packet. Let the term wave packet not scare you. Some people write wave packet as one word, some people in some books, most of the books wave packet is written as two words. I prefer to write these things as one word always, uh, nanoparticle is one word for me wave packet is one word for me because I am influenced by a uh, television series that I saw as a kid uh, that was on uh, body line bowling. You know body line Douglas Jardin Don Bradman. So, there there was this scene where this uh, British reporter is trying to send a message by telegram and he fights with the uh, clerk at the telegraph office because he wrote body line which was uh, a new word at that time there was no such word earlier. So, the clerk insisted that this is two words. So, every time you write body line you have to pay for two words and uh, the journalist insisted that no it is a new word it is one word. So, somehow that got into my head and I like to combine words whenever I can. So, for me wave packet is one word you write whatever you want. What is the meaning of wave packet? What is a wave packet? My favorite answer to this question sounds almost stupid. A wave packet is a packet of waves. It sounds very strange mundane and, uh, but actually that is what it means. You combine a lot of waves right that gives you a packet of waves and you combine them in such a way that at one particular point they are all in phase. Then as you go out on either side they go out of phase and that is why you get a shape like this. Okay. How do you generate a wave packet? We are going to discuss this later. Suppose once again it, it is related with that spectral bandwidth of ultra fast pulses, ultra short pulses. Suppose you excite something using an ultra short pulse. Excitation starts from V equal to 0 of the lowest of the ground electronic state let us say. Right? What is the destination? Can you say that uh, we only populate say v equal to 3, v dash equal to 3 of a, a s 1? You cannot because there is a distribution right. Some molecules will be excited to v dash equal to 3, some might be excited to v dash equal to 2, some will be excited to v dash equal to 4 and so on and so forth. And then that will form a coherent wave packet and coherent wave packet dynamics is an important problem that has been studied for ages in uh, ultra fast spectroscopy. We are going to 
discuss it in this course as well. But for now, uh, this is a wave packet, okay. Ultra short pulse, and this is the shape that you get of the amplitude, amplitude of the wave packet. Now, this entire wave packet is not stationary, it is not a standing wave, the entire wave packet moves, okay, and it moves with what is called a group velocity given by d omega d k 0. Do you get the significance of d omega d k 0? Look at this function, where will the function be equal to 0? z equal to z minus d w d omega d k 0 t is equal to 0, right. That is where this is going to be equal to 0, is that right? What is z by t? So, what we are saying essentially is that z equal to d omega d k 0 t, okay. So, what is z by t? I cut t from here and I write t here. z by t is equal to d omega d k 0, this, why do you call that group velocity all of a sudden? What is z? What is z? Last letter in uh, English alphabet, yes, but in this context what is z? You have to speak loudly, it is a big room, very few people are there, I cannot, I am a little short of hearing. Yeah. What is z? It, z is the direction of propagation of light. So, what is z by t? Distance covered in direction of propagation of light per unit time that is velocity, right. So, z by t essentially is the velocity with which this entire wave packet moves, okay. d omega d k 0. This is called a group velocity not group delay yet, delay comes later. When we talk about delay, you have to talk about two kinds of light. The two kinds of light in this context are fundamental and second harmonic, we will come to that. For now, what we have been able to do is, we have been able to define a group velocity of a wave packet. So, group velocity is d omega d k 0, okay. And just for the record, fundamental and second harmonic have different group velocities and that creates another problem. One problem we have discussed already is delta nu. The other problem is that if fundamental and second harmonic uh, travel with different group velocities, then uh, this is the situation you get as time passes. They move away from each other. So, the question is what is the difference in times taken by fundamental and second harmonic to travel the entire length of the crystal, okay. Once again without derivation, I will give you the expression this is what it is. Delta t is given by 1 by c d n f d lambda f multiplied by lambda f where f is fundamental equal to d n s h d lambda s h multiplied by lambda s h. I might as well have like the uh, previous slide, I might as well have written d n d lambda then put a bracket and written f as subscript that would have for us been better, okay. So, you do not want too much of delta t that is the issue. They have to travel together for the wave packet to sustain. So, now what do you want? You want the delta t to be uh, smaller than the laser pulse, pulse duration, yes. So, uh, in other words we can say that delta t should be almost equal to 0, time required. So, as long as they are within the crystal, they should be together the fundamental and second harmonic. So, if delta t is to be equal to 0, work with this expression, equate that to 0, what do you get? Yes. Achha. While doing that, do not forget something, when you equate that to 0, is there some relationship between lambda f and lambda second harmonic and the better would be. 
what is the relationship? Yes, lambda f equal to 2 multiplied by lambda uh, second harmonic. So, putting this expression into this, what do you get? You get something like this. Okay. This is another condition. D and D lambda of fundamental should multiplied by 2 should be equal to D and D lambda multiplied uh, D and D lambda of second harmonic. D and D lambda right rate of change of uh, refractive index with respect to wavelength for second harmonic should be equal to twice D and D lambda for fundamental. Okay. That is when your delta t is going to be 0 and delta t should be small in order to get good second harmonic generation using an ultra short pulse. All right. So, once again let me show you some typical values delta t for lithium niobate is 6, delta 3 for lithium iodate is 0 0.7, delta t for KDP is 0 0.08. So, which is the best out of these three from this point of view? Definitely KDP. Okay. So, uh, the take home message from uh, this module and the la last one is that one needs to be uh, careful about several things before one can think of doing uh, second harmonic generation or some frequency generation of uh, using ultra short pulses. First of all, you have to choose the right material and there are so many parameters, right. We have said this once already, large value of second order nonlinear susceptibility, birefringence, delta t has to be uh, close to 0 and what else? What is the point we discussed just before this? Delta nu, delta nu has to be as large as possible, okay. One more thing that we have not really said explicitly, do you want to use a crystal that is very large or do you want to use a crystal that is small? I mean that is not too thick, do you want to use a large path length within the crystal, do you want to use a not so large path length? You want to use a thin crystal because here you are talking about delta t, delta t is going to be uh, longer for a, a thicker crystal. See delta t here is given in picosecond per centimeter, right. So, if you use too thick a crystal, first of all there will be dispersion. So, your pulse will become broad and this delta t is also not going to help. So, these are uh, several parameters that one needs to worry about when one wants to do nonlinear uh, optical manipulations using your. Uh, ultra short pulses right so that brings us to the end of the discussion uh, that we intended to do today but uh, let me just give you a preview of what we are going to discuss the next day see so far we have been talking about some frequency generation right combining two photons of small uh, energies to produce a photon of larger energy and that is easily understood. Is it possible to have a photon of large energy split into two photons of smaller energy in a nonlinear optical material? The answer is yes. It is just that it is a much more difficult process compared to some frequency generation. And that splitting into two kinds of light with smaller energy, longer wavelength, that has a name, and that name is parametric generation or optical parametric generation. Okay. So, uh, it is really very small, a one in a million kind of uh, probability, and the phenomenon is not easy to understand. So far, even though we did not do the derivations, we more or less understood what we are talking about because we can think of real life analogies and all. Difference frequency generation is actually not easy to understand because it ha uh, deals with 
things like quantum entanglement. In fact, uh, parametric uh, generation is used to make uh, what are called uh, correlated photons or single photons or photon pairs, not of any use to us as such, but they have uh, they are used in uh, sophisticated uh, uh, optics experiments. We are not going to go into that in this course, but the point is it can happen. What we want to learn is we are saying it is a one in a median kind of probability to get uh, parametric generation. Is there any way to uh, increase the intensity? So, now see what will happen. So far, we were dealing with a situation where signal and idler meet at the nonlinear optical crystal and the pump is generated. In fact, when I say it like this, it sounds a uh, little strange, is not it? Because when we say pump, we think the pump should go in, that is what is going to happen in parametric generation. So, the pump goes in and splits into signal and idler. So, signal and idler both have uh, longer wavelengths, lesser energies. So, this is a good way of generating light of, uh, so if using uh, visible light, it is a good way of generating say IR light. Now, the question is how do we uh, get a higher intensity? Two ways, one is do this parametric generation inside a resonator. So, if you have a parametric generator in say resonator means a laser, a laser cavity, right. If you do multiple reflections, then it happens multiple number of times, you are going to get some, some kind of increase in the output. The other way is to do, to do what is called optical parametric amplification, that is what we use in our lab, right. And that is a two photon process, it is not only the pump that goes in into the nonlinear optical crystal. It is pump and signal and what you generate is signal and idler. Okay. That is what we are going to discuss next day. So, I think next module is going to be a very, very sketchy principle of optical parametric generation and optical parametric amplification. We might not talk too much about optical parametric oscillation and module after that will be a discussion of our topaz manual. What is there inside the optical parametric amplifier that we have? How does it work? Those of you who have worked with topaz, can you tell me what are the different kinds of light that are there inside? There are several crystals, is not it? And what do you do? You do second harmonic generation in some crystals, you do something else in some other crystals. What is that? Do not you generate white light? So, that white light now by angle tuning and all, one particular frequency from that white light, well of course, it is modal frequency that gets amplified. That is how an optical parametric amplification works. So, that is what we are going to uh, sort of learn in the next couple of days and we will perhaps say a few words about, so far we are talking about collinear geometry. In fact, even our topaz has collinear geometry, but there are certain advantages that come if you use non-collinear ge geometry. And in context of uh, optical parametric amplification, that instrument is called a NOPA, non-linear optical parametric amplifier. So, uh, if possible, in the next couple of modules or in the next three modules, this is what we are going to cover. Let us see whether we can give you some uh, brief idea sketchy idea about NOPA as well. Okay. Today we stop here.